It sounds like your CPU may have shaken loose in shipping, they told us. What the hell is that? What do I do with that as a customer, especially if I don't know anything about it? Just yank hard, is what NZXT told one of its customers, who expressed regret when faced with a damaged panel on his case. The customer replied with, yeah, that's why now I have a broken piece of plastic leg. We caught that tweet from NZXT back in April, and we were frustrated and disappointed with how NZXT took a real customer inquiry expressing regret and treated it like a joke meme. Just like the rest of NZXT's wannabe corporate Twitter account, where they try their hardest to be just like Wendy's and dbrand to really high bars to reach. So when we saw all of that, we emailed NZXT's CEO, we expressed our concerns about customer service, and after we got confirmation that NZXT would in fact be focusing on the customer experience, we backed off for a little bit, and then we bought this, the NZXT build. And now we're here to see if NZXT has actually improved its customer support experience for its pre-built systems. We'll also be looking at the pre-built in depth to see the overall quality as it compares to things like the CyberPower, IvyPower, and Walmart disasters that we've purchased previously. Before that, this video is brought to you by our charity auction for this very computer. We didn't want to buy, review, and return it now that we can afford not to, but we also don't want the computer. So we're listing it as a charity auction with 100% of proceeds benefiting Cat Angels, a no-kill cat rescue shelter that we've visited locally, vetted, and helped in the past. Cat Angels saves, cares for, and helps people adopt cats, and we like raising money for their cause. We're definitely losing money on this video, so we'd at least like to make sure someone gets some. The PC's retail value was about $1,500, so if you want to grab the very system we tested and have its side panel autographed by the team, visit the link in the description below to support a good cause while doing it. Pre-built systems are actually really important to the ecosystem of PC gaming. It's what people get into it, into the hobby, and hopefully some of them transition into DIY interests later. But ultimately, not everyone has to build their own computer, and the elitism surrounding DIY PCs is very off-putting in that way, where if you didn't build it yourself, then you're some kind of peon in comparison to the people who did build it themselves. But ultimately, it's an important section of the environment that we're in as PC gamers, and it also means that the pre-built system manufacturers have a lot of responsibility on their shoulders to not screw over new customers, because if they do, then they end up going back to consoles or something like that. So uh, there's a lot on the line for pre-built manufacturers. We've put a lot of them to the test now. We're zero for four on pre-built systems that get out of the box properly configured. In some instances, Walmart, for example, we had two systems arrive incorrectly configured. One of them had a boot device not detected error because it was not configured correctly in BIOS, and the other one was something similar. You can go watch the videos. We had a CyberPower PC that had a cable coming out of the primary SATA drive, and the secondary drive was not even initialized. We had an iBuyPower PC where XMP wasn't on and it had numerous other small issues. So we're over 4. This is going to be our fifth attempt at getting a pre-built PC that when you turn it on is actually configured properly. That's all we're really going for. The bar is low now. But in addition to that, we're testing covertly the customer service of NZXT and its BLD or build team. So some backstory for you. NZXT and IY Power are actually in the same building in California. They're right next to each other in or near City of Industry. This is public information. You can find it easily. NZXT uh, also, interestingly, got into the pre-built space, even though IY Power is owned by the father of the CEO of NZXT. But uh, even though they're sort of competitors in some ways, they've both taken their own paths and have diverged in what they're doing. NDXT BLD is relatively new. It's been incredibly successful for NDXT, and the company has been mostly focused on things like customer service and getting a better build quality or assembly quality overall for their systems than you might see with larger operations like CyberPower, which has blown up in recent years especially. So for this content, we bought this one with our own money. This is the NZXT BLD streaming system. They didn't know we were buying it. We bought it under a different name from anyone they might recognize. We shipped it to a different address than one they might recognize, and we used a different email address than one they might recognize. Our purchases were made under covert operative Pat Snowstain. Snow from Snowflake, the CEO of our operation, obviously, and Stain because that's what it is, and Pat because Patrick technically is the one who bought it. Uh, previously, covert operative Beav Sturk was outed publicly at CES after being seen in Hypebeast uniform, so we couldn't use that name any longer. Uh, so this is the, the approach we took for NDXT's build support testing. We had different 
experiences with the call center and with emails that we're going to be going through today. And the short of it is that NZXT's customer service, much like its Twitter service that we witnessed for one of our viewers, is uh, largely Let's go with ill-equipped is probably the nicest way we can put it here. Before we get into all of that, though, we do need to go through the system hardware, the build quality and assembly, and look at things from that angle. We've learned from past pre-builds that it's important to give the system a full once-over before even turning it on, just to make sure that all the cables, drives, and cards are connected properly. The CyberPower PC we worked on didn't even have the SATA cable fully connected to the primary drive, so this type of thing is important to check. Externally, the only visible blemish was that the I.O. shield hadn't been fully pressed in place. This doesn't affect functionality, and we usually leave the I.O. shield out of our builds altogether. But it could have been better and is a note of attention to detail. Moving inside of the case, NZXT packed the internals with the usual expanding foam pillow. Some of the print from the plastic pillow scuffed off on the backplate of the GPU, but rubbing alcohol should be sufficient to wipe this off once we get around to it. Internal components were held securely by the foam, and nothing shook loose, aided by the fact that the system's storage is a single M.2 drive, so there's no drive sleds or SATA cables to shake loose to begin with. Here's where we start finding problems, though. Unfortunately, neither the EPS 12-volt cable nor the 24-pin ATX power cable were plugged in correctly. Each 4-pin half of the 8-pin CPU power connector was technically plugged in, but only one was fully inserted and actually latched, leaving the second one coming out of the socket. So we had a four pin in there, but not the full eight. Meanwhile, the plus four connector on the 24 pin cable wasn't hooked under the other 20 pins, so it couldn't be inserted or secured fully. This is a technician error. That doesn't happen in shipping, it happens when you build it. Both power connections were functional and allowed the system to boot, and fortunately for NZXT, you don't need both halves of the 8-pin to boot the board, depending on which board you're working with. That said, there was nothing but friction to prevent them from being pulled out, so this was done haphazardly. We'll get back to other physical hardware details in a moment, but we need to first address the memory. NZXT has brandished all over its web page for this product that it uses 3200 MHz RAM. This is technically true, even with XMP off. The Team Vulcan Z memory is, in fact, called T-Force Vulcan Z 16GB 3200MHz. So in the strictest sense of semantics, it is 3200MHz in name. NDXT even printed this on all of the included papers that came with the system that say it's 3200MHz. The single most egregious mistake that we found in the system, given the advertising, was that XMP was not enabled, just like with the iWay power system that we reviewed last year. The system is advertised with 3200 MHz memory, but it was running at 2400 MHz DDR by default. With the Infinity Fabric and memory controller clocks synced to the same speed by default, we end up at 1200 MHz for those. This is the bigger issue. Since it's an AMD system and it's maintaining a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one mode, Infinity Fabric tanks in addition to the memory. We did performance testing both with and without XMP enabled for this particular system, but we'll cover that result later in this piece. Enabling XMP sets the memory to its proper 3200 MHz speed and syncs the Infinity Fabric and memory controller clocks up to 1600. The BIOS version our system shipped with was the most recent public release from November of 2019, which is a point back in NZXT's favor if they bothered to update it themselves. Maybe NZXT set XMP at some point and then forgot to do it again after updating the BIOS. Regardless of how it happened, the end result was that every single BIOS setting was set to MSI's default value, so NZXT fails this test, just like iWebPower did. The CPU fan is next. That was connected to a designated CPU fan header with default PWM fan curves applied with a 100% fan speed threshold at a CPU temperature of 70 degrees Celsius. This is appropriate for the CPU. This is, however, the only fan header which had a fan curve applied by default. The rear fan was plugged into the SysFan1 header, and the front fan was plugged into the PumpFan1 header. Each of these have different default behaviors, and since NZXT left it all to defaults, that's what they ended up running. The pump header defaults to PWM mode and therefore runs the three-pin case fan at full speed, about 1300 RPM, while the system fan header defaults to DC control mode and runs its fan at about 950 RPM. If we believed that were intentional, it would be fine. The problem is that it strongly suggests nobody knew or cared that the case fans would behave differently based on where they were plugged in, and nobody tried to click one button in BIOS to check out the cooling settings 
or even do any tuning to the noise levels. The target audience for these PCs is never going to dig into BIOS settings. Pre-built manufacturers should be tuning them meticulously before shipping them out because ultimately this is a templated PC built. They're building the same damn system over and over every day. It's on the site. You can buy this exact configuration. For a templated build, testing should be rigorous and then automation and Pixie servers should be used to clone settings from one to the next. It doesn't even require manual effort once done the first time. Speaking of fans, it seems like NZXT has given up on its unusual default fan layout for the H500. They knew we'd question the negative pressure system back when they sent us the H500 for review, but they stood behind it. And testing revealed that it did indeed perform better than you might expect with a more standard layout for the fans. Setting the case up with two exhaust fans allowed the GPU to draw air in through the empty PCIe slots, cooling it directly and actually very effectively for the setup. Whereas a normal front to back airflow pattern in our case testing of the H500 and the H510 showed that front to back would struggle to cope with the restrictive front panel design. That was for the review though. There are visible marks where someone at the assembly location manually unscrewed the top exhaust fan and moved it to the front of the case. So this isn't even being done at a factory level when the case is being made. Instead, it's being done at NZXT's warehouse, probably the one in California where they're building the systems. Cable management was fine. Above the power supply shroud, it was very tidy with plenty of zip ties and NZXT's cable management channels taken advantage of. There wasn't any great effort put into tidying up the cables below the power supply shroud, but all of them were tucked out of the way and kept outside of the hard drive cage, which we think was a considerate touch given that there are no pre-installed drives in the cage. So credit's given here because they could have just as easily stuffed them into the cage to get them out of the way. Next is to look for bloatware. For some reason, CAM was pre-installed on the system. We were expecting this to be fair, but there's really no reason at all to have it on this computer. This isn't an i-series intelligent case, if you can call NGXT's butchering of things like fan speeds intelligent. And there's no built-in lighting outside of the CPU cooler. There isn't any NGXT fan controller. There's no NGXT Kraken or other cooler. There's no NGXT power supply. In short, none of the things that might compel someone to actually install CAM are present, but CAM is present. The version pre-installed on the system was 4.4.1. It was able to start up and function in guest mode without a connection to the internet, and it didn't set itself to launch with Windows until we had opened it once. So in the very least, it was minimally annoying and we can't take away as many points as we might otherwise, since they're not popping it up instantly upon boot. A couple of other things to go through here for the assembly and overall setup. Some of these are good points for NZXT2. Other than CAM, nothing funky was going on on the software side of things. So, ignoring CAM, it didn't have any obnoxious bloatware on it, which is what we're really looking for with these more boutique system integrators. Anyone who isn't Dell or HP, as an example, where you start getting into just everybody installs Norton and every other bloated piece of trash you can possibly find on the internet. Corsair probably installs IQ, so they're in there with NJXT for CAM, but overall it wasn't too bad. The pre-installed NVIDIA GPU driver was the then current version, uh, 445.75, current for the time we bought it, and the selected power plan was also correct, it was rise and bounced, which was a point where we thought we might get them, but it's pretty good attention to detail that they actually got that one correct, despite the other attention to detail issues. The SSD was not partitioned pointlessly, which was an annoying feature that we saw in the Walmart PC build, so that's a good thing. Internal components were all installed correctly. The RAM was in the right slots. The GPU was in the top slot. There was no hot glue involved anywhere, unlike the Walmart system. So the PCIe devices were arranged appropriately. The wireless card was situated the furthest away from the GPU possible, which is also a good small thing that was done well. Power connectors being loose was a major strike against NZXT's build quality here. The fact that the system was still set up enough to boot does negate some of that. It's not as bad as what Walmart was doing, or at least its system integrator was doing that it outsourced to. Overall, it looks like someone actually turned this thing on at NZXT before they shipped it which is more than we can say for some pre-built. Part of NZXT's shtick with all this is that they publish some form of benchmarks and guarantees for frame rate with the system, which is a really risky and strange thing to do. But NZXT makes specific claims about gaming performance for things like uh, CSGO and League of Legends, for example. So this particular system is supposed to achieve 160 FPS at 1080p, uh, 110 FPS at 1440p in Fortnite Chapter 2. 
It's supposed to achieve 228 FPS at 1080p, 218 FPS at 1440p in League of Legends, 275, 1080, and 247 FPS at 1440 in CSGO, and so forth. Either way, we need to get into the thing that matters more first, which is NZXT's uh, lack of wherewithal to actually support a customer in a competent or technically competent fashion. So we created a fake issue to stress test customer service. This is a benchmark. We took the same approach we do for technical benchmarks with computers. It wasn't an overly difficult one, but it was a challenge. Before creating this benchmark, we consulted with our own customer service team for the GN store, so store.gamersnexus.net if you want to support us there with things like mod mats and mouse mats. But our customer service guy ha has been doing customer service for about 15 years now for e-commerce and has a lot of experience with it. He has extremely high standards for hiring people to the extent that it's actually really difficult to find people who meet his standards. So we consulted with him on testing methodology to blind test NZXT build based on something he's run into that he uses for tests for hiring people to do the job. And we just kind of restructured it around a pre-build. Because our cables were loose upon arrival, we already had something we could work with. So we decided to just exaggerate that and unplug them completely from the EPS 12 volt header. That would be the test, is if they actually feasibly got disconnected in shipping, it could happen given what we saw when we received it, how would NZXT respond to this? Would they be able to isolate the issue? Our testing methodology wants to identify the following customer service traits. We'll put up a card on the screen for you. So number one is, can tactical support lead us to getting our PC bootable? Number two, can customer service identify and answer multiple questions in an email without missing one or skipping over some details? Number three, can customer service properly intro, outro, and thank the customer while offering appropriate apologies for inconvenience caused? And number four, can customer service reply in a timely fashion? For point number two, any of you in the corporate world are likely used to the joy of sending an email with, say, three questions in it and getting one answer back. So that's what we're doing there. We didn't want to make it too easy, so we artificially used somewhat poor grammar and we didn't bullet or number the questions, which would make it way too easy for them. So we instead typed them in line. This is something our own store support deals with pretty regularly. That's fine. That's how people write in the real world. We wanted to test that. Separately, our benchmark also included some irrelevant information along the way to see if it would trip anyone up, just to kind of, it's kind of like a word problem you would do in math class in elementary school. We're just stuffing extra details in there to see if they can remember by the end of the email what it is they have to go back and address. Seems silly and like it would be trivial, but it wasn't. So that's what we're going to start with. And so Sting Snowpat set forth on his first adventure after Beef Sturk was previously compromised in a covert mission. We wrote this email. You can pause if you want to read the whole thing. But the gist of it is that we started with some unnecessary information. We expressed disappointment that the PC isn't booting or turning on. Then we asked for help. We noted a small hole in the box and said it's not a big deal, but that there's a black scuff on the case panel. This isn't actually true. It was just part of the test. We didn't ask for a resolution of this, but we were more checking to see if NZXT would acknowledge it. It was also a clue for NZXT. If there's damage to the box, a hole in it, and a black scuff on the case, then maybe the issue of no booting is a result of getting banged around. We also told NZXT that we're not very technical, so this sets the stage for how much hand-holding we'll need as a customer. Our tone was overall neutral to friendly, albeit a bit annoying with the poor grammar that we intentionally used and excessive questions. We didn't approach this in an angry fashion. The test is seeking the following. One, Proper introduction or greeting from NZXT. Two, a thanks for the purchase and an apology for the inconvenience, since the customer expressed grief at being unable to play games on his one day off. Three, acknowledgement of the damaged box and the scuff mark, perhaps with a request for a photo of the issue to be addressed appropriately. Four, we asked how to get the computer to boot and provided basic info. No display out, but lights and fans are on. This is the main issue buried in the middle of the email. And five, we asked what the bag is for that came with the system that has cables, antennas, things like that. And we also asked what the SATA cables were without identifying them by name. And DXT reply was this email. We are obscuring the employee's name so they don't get harassed by our viewers, but the company replied in about 20 hours, which is actually a really great response time. And they get high points for that, especially now given the current world situation. So let's go through those points one by one after that first set of responses from NZXT support. Number one, NZXT did greet us with hello. They did have an auto sign-off signature 
good enough, that passes that test. So they also said thanks. So this all counts. They've done well here. Number two, NDXC did apologize for the lack of display on the system. They uh, passed point number two for that reason. Number three, NDXT absolutely completely failed this test. It tripped over itself here. There was zero acknowledgement of any shipping damage at all. Absolutely none. No reference at all to the statements made. There wasn't a question mark after those statements, but they should have been addressed, and that was part of the test here. There was no request for further information on the black scuff mark or the cosmetic damage that we mentioned. We wouldn't expect a return for this, and when we asked our CS agent at GN what they would do, the first suggestion to the customer would probably be, hey, try cleaning it off with a rag, see if it comes off, if it's just like a rubber scuff. If it does, cool, no problem. And if not, then send us photos and we'll figure out what to do next. Maybe we'll replace the whole panel for you. That's what we were hoping to see here, at least to start to that. NDXT gets a big fat F for this test for not even noticing the problem and ignoring it completely, which just reflects on NDXT's attention to detail or lack thereof. NDXT, point number four, suggested that the monitor might not be plugged into the correct spot despite all of the clues of shipping damage. That's fine, it's not a bad start, but they don't know what computer we have yet. Number five, NDXT did address the antenna and sort of address the SATA cables by noting it's all extra if you wanted to add things down the line. Not a great response since it doesn't educate the customer, but it's good enough and we'll be lenient here. Point number six is one, it's an extra one. This is a final point and it's very important. And NDXC, damn it, I hope you're taking notes. NDXC didn't ask us for our order number or any way to identify ourselves. This is important. Uh, so we're not using an email that we use to place the order. They have no way of tracking where this order came from. They don't even know if we have a system. At this point, NDXT has no way to even verify if we have a DGPU. They don't know if we have an IGP. They don't know if we have a CPU that can have an IGP. And we don't, by the way. That's not actually possible with this one. NDXT should have saved the time and reduced correspondence by at least one email in the future, technically two with the response, by asking for the order ID at the end of this first email. It's fantastic to help a customer without needing that information. To just stonewall and ask that first, that would have sucked and it just looks like they're buying time. But they could offer that help and then ask for it at the end and they get an F for failing this basic step needed to progress. Our reply really tried to lead NDXT to the water, a trend that will repeat itself. We thanked them. Then we asked to clarify if the video slot was, quote, up near the black scuff that I mentioned previously. That was just to see if they'd acknowledge it after the issue being forced upon them twice. We then switched our tone from neutral to uh, more of a concerned customer's tone. Remember that Pat Stain isn't particularly adept technically, so he expresses concern that the top video slot is broken since NZXT is asking us to use the middle one instead. Obviously, we know that a DGPU means the IGP slot won't output video, and we also know that this CPU doesn't have an IGP, but our customer doesn't know that. NDXT replied asking for the order number. Finally, remember that this is an AMD system without an IGP. NDXT hasn't even verified if we have onboard video yet. Even still, rather than explaining what they do, they replied in sort of an annoyed tone. Quote, also the vertical slot at the top is not broken. It is just disabled. That is completely intended because you purchased a GPU. The GPU is what is halfway down the back and horizontal. Again, that's all kind of correct, but they don't actually know what our computer is yet. It could be an H1 for all they know, in which case that wouldn't even really be true. It could also not have an, a GPU. That's an option. You can custom build the system with that one. Or maybe it doesn't have onboard video and that's not present in the vertical position. So we then started to take the angry customer tone just as a test. Quote, but why would you put two slots on there? We asked. Why would you install an extra one if it's not even possible to use? I don't appreciate paying for something I can't even use, we said. We then provided a tracking number rather than an order ID just to test if they would look it up that way, and to their credit, they did. NZXT's next reply was this one. The relevant information is that they asked us to identify a troubleshooting LED, finally, and sent us an image of the motherboard with those LEDs boxed in a square. We're finally getting somewhere many days later. We told NDXT that the CPU LED was in fact turning on. Remember, our issue that we fabricated here is that the EPS 12 volt cable isn't plugged in and we're trying to see if they can figure that out without us telling them. We actually did this and we booted it just to make sure we could report back the behavior accurately. We noted that NDXT hasn't answered several of the other concerns in our email here and that was another hint back to the scuffed panel comment earlier. And then we moved on. 
Finally, NDXT replies with what is probably one of the worst troubleshooting and customer service emails we've ever seen. Quote, it sounds like your CPU may have, sh may have shaken loose in shipping. If you feel comfortable reseeding it, you are more than welcome to. That's how they spelled it. But if not, then we will need to get this back. Can you confirm your address? So ignoring the bad grammar from that one, if NDXE actually has CPUs shake loose at any regularity in their shipping process, there's uh, an entirely different layer of incompetence that needs to be addressed. We could probably throw this computer out of the fourth floor window. And in all likelihood, although everything else would be beat to hell, probably the CPU cooler would still be mounted to the socket. Yes, it's PGA. But it's still, these, these new AMD coolers, those clips are nasty. So it's probably gonna stay in there. NZXT also provided absolutely zero guidance of what reseeding even means here, much less how to do it. But instead puts the customer in a dangerous situation where they're saying, hey, if you wanna try it, go for it, no problem. But they don't provide any links, any documentation, or even a definition for our technically illiterate customer as to what this means. So now the customer might look up how to reseed a CPU and then end up with a bunch of smashed pins. Whose fault is it at that point? Uh, so this is all just basically NDXT's approach to fix it was, well, just send it, bro, or <laughs> follow me, watch this. So at this point, NDXT got an F for identifying the problem rather than uh, starting with obvious things like check the power cables, reseat the RAM, which anyone can do with basic instructions, clear CMOS, or even verifying that the monitor is in the right mode, although they did have the CPU LED to go off of, NDXT instead jumps to lull the CPU shook loose. Uh, so the company next offered us express shipping both ways to get this fixed, which is an insane waste of money for NDXT when it could be solved by providing a simple bulleted list of basic troubleshooting steps. NDXT, I've just found the way to save your company a lot of money every year on RMAs. So we were also shocked that NDXT never asked for photos to help troubleshoot because a single photo would have been the key to the problem. A technician should hopefully be able to say, hey, those cables aren't plugged in. That's the problem. No express shipping both ways. Imagine that. We eventually called NDXT as well. And the short of the call was that the new technician, who seemed very nice, mind you, and they get points for that, uh, ended up agreeing with the first technician saying that the CPU may have shaken loose, didn't take the time to read the previous ticket, which is disappointing, and then we re-socketed the CPU on the call with his assistance and told him that it still didn't boot. He then ex suggested express shipping. So finally, exhausted on how bad this process was and how poor the support was versus how I would want to see it run, I asked them if maybe there are other things we could try first before shipping it across the country twice. After some pushing, they suggested maybe we should check the cables. So they still never asked for a photo of the system, but at least that would eventually get to the solution of the problem. And man, was that hard to get there. So as the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to water and then you can drown it and let its lungs fill up with water. So it was painful to lead NDXT to the solution, but they eventually got there. We just had to actually drown them in the water to get them to drink it. We're gonna do some really quick performance testing now. We have a whole bunch of performance data that we're not gonna publish just because the video is so long from the customer service side of things, like a lot of focus on thermals, but instead we're just gonna focus on proving the point of NDXT should have just toggled XMP on. It's so easy and we'll show you some performance uplift. So for testing methodology, you can defer to our CPU test suite and read about the methodological choices in that documentation if you wanna see why we're doing what we are. And let's just get started and get through some quick numbers. We'll start with F1 2019. This game is always the highest frame rate of our test suite, so it'll run objectively well regardless, but it's still useful in the comparative sense. NZXT's testing team is probably still inexperienced enough that it'll look at 186 FPS average and ask why we're being nitpicky except that the performance delta between these two results is actually a pretty massive 8.5%. 8.5% is about the same you'll see out of a change from one CPU to the next in the price class, or from one GPU to an option price maybe $50 higher, except that this doesn't cost anything, and NDXT has kneecapped itself artificially by neglecting this option. Frame time consistency also improves here as reflected in low values in this test. In Hitman 2, we saw a performance improvement of 6.5% just by enabling XMP. It matters to skip settings like these, and when you're paying at least something of a premium to have it built for you, it really is important that the company ticks all of the boxes. 
That includes looking over its work before shipping it out, especially if it's going to advertise one speed all over the product documentation everywhere, and then ship with another. Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows a 7.2% improvement by doing NZXT's job for it, literally four button presses for this one. In a more CPU-bound scenario, GTA 5 shows a difference of 8.8% average FPS just for that one toggle. Why this made it through QC is again beyond us, but a few companies have failed this test so far. If they're advertising those XMP speeds, it really needs to run at those XMP speeds. This is actually something that several customers have complained about in NDXT's reviews on its webpage, including one who pointed out that, uh, although they got the measure of units run at gigahertz, pointed out that it should be 3200 and it shipped at a lower speed. So we're gonna stop there. The charts have proven the point well enough. Uh, there's overall, NDXT had some upsides and we went through those already, but kale management was good. Overall part selection is more or less matched. It's not like they have horribly mismatched part selection like you see sometimes where there'll be a 1200 watt power supply with something that draws 400 watts. So they've done better there than other companies have, but really dropped the ball hard with customer service and with setting up BIOS correctly, which are probably the two main things that an SI needs to do properly because they're the two things that the average person who it doesn't really want to build a computer is going to need. They're going to need someone to go through and do those intermediate level things or just offer good support. So we're unimpressed with the technical troubleshooting abilities of NZXT support staff thus far. The company should probably have a pre-written document at this point that it sends out to every support request that about like a, a no boot scenario that just says, here's some basic stuff any customer can do and try this out before you know, we progress. An example might be check the which video device is being used, check if the power switch on the back's flipped, reseat the RAM, whatever they think a customer can reasonably do, there should at least be a beginner level troubleshooting guide. What's terribly inefficient is sending out one-off guesses and extremely short emails that aren't all that helpful that are just, well, maybe the CPU shook loose, you can try and reseat it if you want to. What the hell is that? What do I do with that as a customer, especially if I don't know anything about it? Uh, also, Again, if CPU is shaking loose, there's a serious problem somewhere else. So customer service is uh, also wasting a lot of NZXT's money with this approach, and the management should probably look at this and evaluate what upfront work they can do at something of a cost now, like guides, for example, in order to reduce the later cost of express shipping both ways. So they were sending us YouTube videos to random YouTubers who, actually not even really YouTubers, more of just like random people who've uploaded things, not necessarily professionals, uh, who are showing how to socket or install a cooler, for example, which is just like, cool, that's fine. And the video link does a fine job at explaining it. But NDXT's support, and we didn't include this in the rest of the video, but the support was, here's how you reseat the CPU, which we suggested you try, Here's a link to a random YouTube video. And then they said, oh, but do it in reverse because this guy's showing how to install it, but you need to actually remove it and then put it back in. So it's like, if you're doing that, come on, NDXT, how hard is it to just make your own video guides? You've got a studio where you're taking photos somewhere. Just get someone who's reasonably competent. Your case designers are pretty good and have them host some video about it. Uh, so, any, or I don't know, Paul and Kyle are like down the street, go pay them to do it. So anyway, that's all stuff that could be really improved on the CS side. Uh, we are going to give NZXT overall credit for a clean build, for at least socketing the parts correctly. Uh, didn't tick all the boxes, but uh, I don't know. Failing to respond to like the visual scuff mark again, which we, we fabricated as a task, but failing to even acknowledge it is, is pretty bad. So uh, the build works and it boots, which is more than we can say sometimes but it's not really configured properly. So um, also NDXC didn't even use its own parts for everything. Like they didn't use their power supply and they make power supplies. They didn't use their coolers and they make coolers. So maybe their cost is too high where it's cheaper to just buy someone else's part, but still not really the image you want to portray. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching as always. You can support us directly by going to store.gamersaccess.net to pick up things like mod mats for PC building or wireframe mouse mats, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for behind the scenes and extra videos like patrons XGN. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.